Okay. Share my PowerPoints. Um, welcome to our webinar, everyone. Thank you all for being here. My name is Joka. My co-host Edo and I are from the German Institute for Democracy and Development. Each week we talk on a new topic regarding human rights issues, democracy, the operations of the European Union, etc. We are inviting MEPs, journalists, activists, experts, professors to talk on these topics. Today we will be discussing the 21st century solutions to counter the dangers of radicalization and terrorism. Special attention will be given to the role of the EU, the influence of COVID-19 and the importance of online initiatives. For today's topic, we are joined by Fabio Massimo Castaldo, He's a vice president of the European Parliament and will be speaking on the problem of jihadist radicalization and terrorism, while also providing an overview of the EU's initiatives to counter this and all forms of extremism. Secondly, we have Mr. Abdul Bassi. He's a research fellow at the International Center for Political Violence and Terrorism. He will be talking on the influence of COVID-19 on terrorism and radicalization. Furthermore, Dr. William Alcorn from the University of Leeds and Associate Director at Center for the Analysis of the Radical Right. He will be discussing counter narratives for the extreme rights online. And lastly, uh, Ms. Marie Schröter, co-founder of Detective Collective. She will be talking on the benefits and limits of artificial intelligence in combating radicalization and terrorism. Um, so we will start with the first speaker since uh, Mr. Casalo is still joining us. So we will start with Mr. Basit. I'll give the floor to you now. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me in, and giving me this opportunity to share my thoughts and views on the impact of uh, COVID-19 on terrorism. Uh, it is my pleasure to be here. Um, so uh, when uh, COVID-19 pandemic uh, uh, was first reported, uh, you know, uh, in the uh, last few months of 2019, and uh, we saw the full impact of uh, the pandemic in the initial months of 2020. So there were quite a few speculations made uh, uh, about how the pandemic is going to impact uh, violent extremism, radicalization, terrorism. And there was this fear uh, expressed by some analyst institutions, even United Nations uh, counterterrorism department that with increasing isolation as a result of lockdowns uh, and uh, closure of uh, uh, educational institutes, increasing uncertainty of how long this is going to last and how many people are going to die, what kind of impacts uh, COVID-19 is going to have on our way of life, um, all of it. So it increases the anxiety, uh, it increases the uncertainty. So a youth which is spending more time online, uh, unsupervised time, they perhaps are vulnerable to radicalization. So these kind of views emerged. Uh, and then th there was this concern that, you know, something should be done uh, to keep an eye or, or, or monitor how people are spending time online and how militant or uh, terrorist groups uh, across the ideological spectrum are trying to, you know, appropriate uh, the outbreak of COVID-19 into their ideological narratives. Uh, so uh, there were speculations. Uh, now this, it has been almost a year and we can, you know, speak with more certainty 
about how much impact the COVID-19 actually had on terrorism. Uh, one difficulty which was there methodologically speaking that uh, uh, in contemporary history, we really don't have an example where a, how to you know, measure the impact of a pandemic on terrorism. So the closest we get is to look at the relationship between natural disasters and conflict or terrorism. So if we look at uh, the 2004 tsunami in Asia uh, and then how terrorism in different uh, regions evolved, we, we get a very paradoxical picture. For instance, in Indonesia, in the aftermath of tsunami, uh, uh, Indonesian government and one rebel Islamist rebel group in the Aceh province, the Free Aceh movement, they resolved the conflict. But if you look at Sri Lanka, in Sri Lanka, in the aftermath of uh, tsunami, uh, the uh, ethno-nationalist violence of uh, LTT or the liberation tigers of Tamil Elam, it, that violence increased. So we really don't get a very you know, concrete pictures of, uh, in terms of how terrorism involves in a post-natural uh, disaster uh, scenario. <clears throat> in any case, that's the closest that we get. But now there is some data and we can speak empirically that how it has evolved. So if we look at four categories, number one is militant violence, number two, uh, extremist uh, ideologies or violent extremist narratives, uh, recruitment patterns and patterns of fundraising of the extremist and terrorist groups, we do get a picture. For instance, if we, if we look at militant violence, now uh, using data of Accolade uh, database, University of Chicago, a recent research has come out from the University of Chicago, where 40 researchers under Dr. Robert Pape were, uh, you know, <clears throat> collating data and they analyzed it. If we look at that and also look at various databases of different regions, for instance, South Asia Terrorism Portal, uh, this is a database uh, based by uh, an online think tank based in India and other various regional databases. We see that, uh, you know, 2020 in an overall uh, sense was a down year for militant violence. And this downward trajectory of militant violence started in 2017. And that continued into 2020 as well. So uh, uh, frankly, then with the exception of the sub-Saharan Africa, where militant violence increased throughout 2020. In the rest of the region, South Asia, Southeast Asia, Europe and, and the US uh, and different other parts of the world, militant violence decreased. And that decrease uh, in the first six months of 2020 continues. But in the next six months, the last six months of 2020, then militant violence uh, starts increasing again, uh, which is going back to the pre-COVID-19 levels. Uh, it, it starts rising in the first two months of 2021. Uh, the uptake of violence then has continued. Uh, the exception to that is sub-Saharan Africa. So 139 countries that University of Chicago researchers analyzed of those countries, uh, the 10 countries where militant violence was increasing, the majority of those countries are based in sub-Saharan Africa. Now, what was happening in that region is this is where uh, the affiliates of Al-Qaeda are fighting with uh, Islamic State militant groups. Uh, so it's not state versus non-state groups engaged in a conflict. It is two non-state violent actors engaging in a conflict. Uh, but if you look at uh, countries where uh, most of terrorism, uh, you know, emanates, Syria, Syria, Afghanistan, Pakistan, uh, it's not just the COVID-19, but there are local factors as well resulting in declining of violence. For instance, uh, in Syria and Iraq, what has contributed to a significant decline in violence is uh, a, a withdrawal of American forces or drawdown of American forces, coupled with the decimation of the Islamic State, both in Iraq and Syria. If you look at Afghanistan, why in the first six months of uh, 2020 violence declined, 
alongside covid-19 there was a, a us taliban deal which was signed in february last year in doha and that deal mandated a reduction in violence by the taliban so that clause of the agreement where taliban were required to reduce violence to create a conducive environment for intra afghan negotiation to start that resulted in 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 decline in violence so overall uh, you know we don't see much of an impact of covid-19 on militant violence yes uh, if you try to isolate the data university of chicago researchers found that in any country of the 139 countries that they analyzed in any country uh, where uh, first covid-19 related fatality was reported for the first two months terrorist violence or militant violence declined but then it started rising again so we don't get a very you know this uh, uh, idea of how militant violence so i think there was a continuity the six months there was a slump but then it is going back to the pre covid 19 levels uh, so that's for the militant violence if we go to the second category which is uh, extremist ideologies and extremist narratives uh, there are three things to note Uh, number one is that initially various groups across the ideological spectrum whether it is the extreme right far right and white supremacist groups in the west uh, whether it is uh, the jihadist uh, salafist jihadist militants taliban in afghanistan or pakistan in these areas groups across the ideological spectrum used covid-19 uh, for ideological validation for instance uh, al qaeda and isis were saying this is the punishment of god uh, 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 covid 19 is a wrath of god which is uh, impacting uh, quote on quote the infidels for waging war against islam in the muslim countries etc uh, and then in the west we saw uh, uh, you know groups blaming uh, the jewish uh, community also blaming china minority communities and you know Uh, there were some incidents of violence as a result of that as well but as time moved on and they saw that covid-19 doesn't discriminate along ideological racial or geographical lines uh, the narratives also evolved which shows the opportunistic character of these groups uh, so initially there was an explosion of uh, you know narratives on social media around covid-19 but after june july as the first impact of covid-19 receded or lockdown started to you know normalize and people got used to it we see that uh, the the narratives were uh, going back to the pre covid uh, uh, 19 related things talking about more mundane things leadership losses internal conflict their positions on various issues related to those groups for instance taliban increasingly talking about uh, the kind of government they want to have in afghanistan uh, is is talking about its caliphate loss of territory blah blah uh, all and al qaeda did the same so initially there was this euphoria in these groups about covid-19 but later on those narratives evolved and covid-19 less and less references were made to covid-19 now what kind of impact then covid-19 left on 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 these narratives i think uh, these groups tried to increase uh, their sympathies uh, within uh, the the confused youth uh, one thing that is worrisome is while militant violence declined uh, the foundational elements uh, of violent extremism such as conspiracy theories misinformation disinformation polarization hatred and intolerance uh, that has increased so what is to worry about is we got to look at how in the post covid 19 scenario all these narratives evolve and what kind of impact they are going to have on violent extremism as of now we don't have um, any yardstick to measure uh, that the kind of impact it is having Uh, but they they opportunistically used it initially and then they started talking about different things uh, as far as fundraising and recruitment is concerned i think these two categories are more difficult to measure 
or map. Uh, but I think uh, one thing that can be said with certainty is that recruitment has moved online. Uh, most of it is done now online. And uh, these groups have used this opportunity uh, to, to you know, spot people and uh, try to use narratives to lure them into their worldviews and maybe use them later uh, uh, once uh, the, the lockdowns are relaxed and these groups are back to uh, what we can call is uh, a normal uh, way of life. Uh, one more thing which is, uh, which is uh, interesting in this uh, uh, time is that two, we are seeing two waves of terrorism coexisting right now. We have a religious wave of terrorism which started with the, uh, the, the, the Islamic revolution in Iran and the Afghan Jihad. That wave has weakened because of uh, the territorial defeat of the Islamic State and leadership decapitation of Al-Qaeda. This the, the jihadist wave has weakened, but it is still resilient and continuing. Alongside that, now we have this ethno-nationalist wave in the West that has come of age. It has the ability to network on various social media platforms. It has inflicted violence as well, and it has that transnational character uh, to it as well. So you have this situation, and that happened during the COVID-19, where two waves of terrorism, the religious a uh, fundamentalist wave of terrorism and ethno-nationalist wave spearheaded by the extreme right in the West uh, coexisting. Uh, also, uh, we saw a lot of confusing signals coming from across the ideological spectrum in terms of how people were picking and choosing various ideas, particularly self-radicalized individuals. Uh, for instance, uh, recently there was a case uh, where uh, a group of uh, Bangladeshi migrant workers in Singapore, they were deported because they were self-radicalized online. And uh, they, they were, uh, you know, uh, they, once you look at their profiles and the trajectories of their radicalization, they were ready to go to Syria and they sympathize with the caliphate narrative of ISS. But in case they couldn't go to Syria, they were also willing to go to, uh, you know, Afghanistan to join Al-Qaeda. So on one hand, you have them talking about caliphate, but on the other hand, you also see uh, they were open to the idea of going and joining Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan if it, they couldn't go to Iraq. Likewise, we see within uh, uh, the, the far right spectrum in the West that people are not subscribing to just one particular ideology, narrative of set of ideas, rather they pick and choose. So there is this ideological confluence or overlapping of various uh, uh, ideas uh, uh, resulting in a very chronic and a very confusing picture. And that makes it really, really difficult uh, on the response side that how do you prepare against this kind of threat, which is more, uh, you know, uh, uh, it, 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 it's, it's not easy to pinpoint one particular thing. Uh, so I think uh, in, in, in a nutshell, I would say, that uh, the impact of COVID-19 on terrorism, uh, initially there were more, more noise, but less action. Uh, but as time passed uh, and, and we saw uh, some data emerge, so on the militant violence side, there has been less of an impact. On the ideological side, uh, people have opportunistically, uh, you know, uh, used it for their ideological validation. But later on, uh, the the pre-COVID-19 pre things were back. I'll stop here and we can discuss more uh, during the Q&A and discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Basit. Um, as you can see, Mr. Casado has joined us now. Um, so if he wants, uh, he can have his part of the talk now. Thank you and good afternoon to all the distinguished panelists that uh, will are joining our discussion today. My name is Fabio Massimo Castaldo. I'm uh, one of the vice president of the European Parliament, especially in, in, in charge of human rights and democracy inside uh, our house and I'm also I'm a full member of the uh, Foreign Affairs Committee and the Defense Committee. 
uh, subcommittee of the, of the European Parliament. I would like again to, to greet the other distinguished speakers of today, Dr. Abdul Basit, that just spoke uh, before me, Dr. William Alcorn, who will take the floor, leader, Mrs. Mary Schroeder, and all the other friends that will join us in this important debate. And you will know, of course, a big thanks to the German Institute for Democracy and Development and to Mrs. Sass and Mr. Schone for their kind invitation. I hope I didn't uh, brutalize with my pronunciation of, uh, of German your, um, uh, your family name. But first of all, just to also going ahead from um, the interesting remarks of uh, Dr. Abdul Basit, let's clarify, of course, that when we are speaking and using the term of jihadists, or Islamic terrorism, we are referring to a distorted, politicized uh, and misinterpretation of the Islamic religion. And by no means, of course, we should extend this concept to all those who practice a religion of peace, such as Islam. After the outbreak of the pandemic, the attention of the public opinion decision makers shifted from certain security aspects such as terrorism to the fight against COVID-19. But however, between October and November 2020, the terrorist attacks in Paris, in Nice and Vienna later on reaffirmed the centrality of the threat for the EU citizens and for the EU core values, such as the refusal of violence, inclusivity and solidarity among our people and our citizens. Before analyzing this threat uh, and its root cause, namely the radicalization, it is important to have a look at the data in general. According to the data collected by Europol and published in the yearly TSAT reports, between 2014 and 2019, in the world Europe, uh, we have recorded 1,007 terrorist attacks from all motives. Uh, jihadist attacks have been slightly less than 10%, 98 in total, if you look at the whole picture, but they caused almost all the victims. That means 374 on 388. Uh, for 2020, this TSAT report has not yet been published, but the Italian Observatory on Radicalization and Counterterrorism counter React reports seven victims in 25 attacks. Looking at the numbers of the terrorist attacks and total death per year, we can understand the threat of jihadist, uh, jihadist terrorism in Europe, and despite the consistent increase in the number of events, their lethality has dropped. 2015, you, we, all, we are all still this scene in mind from Charlie Hebdo and Bataclan, 150 persons uh, were killed in 17 attacks. 2016, uh, 135 deaths in 13 attacks. Again, 2017, uh, Manchester Arena bombing, Barcelona truck, uh, 62 casualties in 33 attacks. 2018, 30, 13 victims in 24, and uh, mainly the main, the main event was a Strasbourg attack, and I was, of course, one of the MEPs who was uh, stuck in the parliament during this such a tragic event. And in 2019, again, the main event was the Utrecht, the Utrecht shooting with 10 deaths in 21 attacks. This is, this is due, in my opinion, to three major factors. The first one is the central organizations, such as the Islamic State and Al-Qaeda, are losing power on the ground, on their, in the soil of their natural uh, space, meaning that they are less capable than before to provide financial and tactical support to their cells operating in, in, uh, in other territories, most of which have been dismantled also thanks to the force of intelligence and police uh, of uh, multiple um, states. The weapons used by terrorists are less sophisticated. The bombs or the firearms used in the early years, um, I'm referring to Madrid 2004, London 2005, Paris 2015, again Brussels 2016, have been substituted by knives and melee weapons. Uh, plus some vehicles in 2016 and 17, but effective countermeasures have been taken in a relatively simple way by placing obstacles in the path of uh, as a terrorist should follow for attacking with a car or a van in sensitive locations. The third aspect we have to underline is that the attacks tend to be carried out by single individuals and not by organized group and cells, the so-called lone wolves. Uh, this consistently reduces their effectiveness and the spectacularity of these attacks, but makes it more difficult to discover plans and to foil them. With a few exceptions, nice, the Nice truck attack on the Berlis Christmas market truck attack, uh, both of them in 2016, Manchester Arena bombing in 2017, all these attacks conducted by single perpetrators did not cause several deaths. 
But be, let's be very careful on this regard. We should refer to individual perpetrator and not to the lone wolves as this definition that I was using, that is used in the common language is a bit deceptive in fact. Indeed, uh, the attackers maintain strong ideological ties with the central organization, and they are always in contact with a rad radicalizing factor that can be a person, uh, an, extremist um, an, an extremist preacher, for example, or it can be either in a, a physical or in a virtual world, uh, but also with propaganda material that serves as a source of inspiration at the ideological and psychological level, but it can also provide insights on how to carry out an attack with rudimentary weapons or self-constructed bombs. Uh, therefore, in my opinion, it appears clear that currently terrorists are answering a personal call to violence to be carried out in any place with any available means in accordance with the Islamic State leadership's call that you remember in the, in the previous years. Uh, the days of structural attacks meticulously planned by terrorist cells widespread in the European territory seems to be for the moment, let's hope gone, although the level of alert must remain quite high, for leaving space to an army of sympathizers of terrorist ideology who decide to embrace violence individually or in small groups. This fact makes the terrorist activities less impactful by cost, but consistently harder to prevent. Therefore, it is of the utmost importance to put all the resources to system and to back up the preventive initial activities conducted by law enforcement and intelligence agencies with other initiatives addressing the root cause of the terrorist phenomenon that, that is, of course, the radicalization. Radicalization is a complex phenomenon that encompasses several faces of uh, all an individual's life and it is usually very difficult if not impossible to identify uh, common grounds that are valid for each single individual and for people who become radicalized and commit terrorist acts. However, in the early 2000s, uh, some com common patterns started to be clear. People perpetrating terrorist attacks in Europe were mostly homegrown terrorists, meaning that they were born and grew up or at least residing permanently in the country in which they struck or other European ones. Uh, according to data collected by the Italian uh, observatory uh, of REACT that I was uh, quoting before, in the period between 2004 and 2020, 46 of terrorists were regular migrants, a percentage that includes several people who moved to Europe in a very early age with their family and spent most of their li lives in Europe. 27% were second or, or third generation even of migrants and 60% were just 16%, a very low percentage were irregular migrants. 8% were Europeans who converted to Islam and embraced uh, the distorted and politicized view of the religion. So they were unfortunately falling to uh, people that were supposed to, they were trying to identify themselves uh, as a, a religion guide, but uh, in fact, they were uh, more uh, promoting a totally distorted vision and interpretation of Islam. In the literature, the main catalyzing factor of the radicalization is identified in the impossibility for the individual to find a sense of belonging to a community a problem that has been exacerbated by the fact that long-term migrants and second third generation migrants might find it difficult to adhere with the costumes of the country in which they are living while simultaneously they are encountering difficulties in identifying themselves with their ancestors tradition so they are somehow stuck in the middle of two um, identities. Uh, this led people to following what uh, a prominent Italian scholar and professor uh, to uh, the, M the MIT in Boston and both in Rome, Alessandro Orsini, that is a sociologist of terrorism, defined as the leitmotiv of radicalization, the acceptance of a dichotomic word view based on good and evil, where the former is represented by the violent ideology that promises redemption for all the vexation caused by the latter and justifies and glorifies all attempts to destroy the system which is against the Homma, uh, that is, of course, the pure vision of the Muslim community which must be protected and advanced. This, of course, provides a sense of belonging to a group that might be appealing for fragile individuals. It is important, again, to refer to individuals since the beginning of the radicalization process is always depending on a single person who searches answers to its existential questions and ends up finding the answers in a violent ideology. Therefore, 
to be effective initiatives intended to for countering radicalization should be based on a mutual understanding uh, that should the start at an early age involving schools and the youth associations. And this is a double uh, since the vast majority of OJS terrorists are educated in the EU member states. So it's a, it's a particular challenge for us that we have to take a look with a strong cooperation with schools and the youth associations. We should also proceed also with adults, of course, and adequate measures should be put in place in order to minimize the risk of radicalization through uh, initiatives intending for promoting tolerance, intercultural dialogue, personal development, and full inclusion and participation in political, social, and working life. Uh, besides policy and financial incentives for doing that, it is essential to reach in-depth cooperation among migrants' communities, religious institutions, national and local authorities, uh, minorities, associations, involving, again, high-qualified persons such as psychologists and experts in Islamic studies. Similarly, adequate the, the, the radicalization path supported by professionals of the sector must be put in place for rehabilitating those people that have fallen into the violent ideology but show some signs of willingness to abandon it with a special attention of course to penitentiary institutes that somehow if they are not followed in the proper way can become a kind of a university of radicalization so and, and here again with the uh, programs that has been experienced uh, in italy in france in germany in many other countries we can try to tackle this issue and to use them on the country uh, to prevent this, uh, for this high risk of radicalization within the penitentiary institutes. As a result, for putting in place efficient and effective counter and anti-terrorism activities, it is essential to combine the repressive measures intended for preventing terrorists to for from turning to action in the, in the immediate term and preventive measures. So again, preventive and, and, and repressive uh, high and adequate balance and with the preventing addressing to the root cause, namely the radicalization in the medium and the long run. We should overcome the paradigm that sees the former, uh, that means of course the repressive as a prerogative or right-wing politics and the latter as ex exclusively concerning left-wing left -wing politics. Uh, they must be combined only in this way we can try to minimize the problem of jihadist terrorism in Europe. And again, a few words on the EU commitment to counter terrorism, what is there, what is now actually in place and what needs to change in the, uh, in the future. The EU uh, is taking a concrete steps for counter terrorism for all motives that we have exposed previously. Uh, although jihadist terrorism has been at the core of these efforts for the reasons I mentioned above that is most lethal and most spectacular, spectacular somehow kind of terms that is part of course also of the mediatic impact they would like to achieve with the actions. Uh, about the existing measures, let's remember that uh, we have a counter-terrorism counter strategy since 2005, first document on the subject, is based on four pillars, prevention, protection, pursuit and response. And uh, all are addressed uh, to face the terrorist threat in all its faces and also in a coordinated manner of at the European level. Again, in the wake of uh, Paris attacks of 2015, the Council launched new initiatives to counter terrorism, materialized measures taken in 2017, which include stricter control on transfer of posse on possession of firearms, strengthened controls at the external borders, criminal prosecution of terrorist offenses, including recruitment of individuals, facilitation of travel abroad and fundraising. Then again, the establishment of European Counterterrorism counter Center, ECTC, in 2016 to strengthen information sharing and operational cooperation on monitoring and investigating foreign terrorist fighters, trafficking in illegal firearms and terrorist financing combating online radicalization based on a deeper involvement of, pri of the pri private sector as well in monitoring and timely removing online propaganda material. This, of course, including through the EU Internet Forum and the revised position in 2018 uh, of the Council, uh, where the Council approved the negotiating position on the proposal for a regulation on preventing the dissemination of terrorist content online that has been finally adopted just a, a couple of months ago, in the 11th of January 
January 2021 by the European Parliament, and we, on which I'm, of course, really proud of this result. And again, it strengthened cooperation with third countries. And the key example, of course, is the Joint Action Plan of, on Counterterrorism for the Western Balkans signed in 2018. This is a crucial region, the Western Balkans, especially as we have seen also uh, from the origin of uh, perpetrators of the Vienna attack of many others. There is a, is a region in which still the scares of, uh, of war are opening spaces uh, for mm, violent preachery and uh, for the attempt of recruitment. All these initiatives were reaffirmed in the Union Security Strategy published by in July uh, 2020, which devotes an entire chapter to counterterrorism. As the Commissioner Skinas stated during the presentation, <clears throat> in order to increase the security of the Union, we need to overcome the fragmentation of the legislation between states, as well as between the online and the physical world, and also between the internal and external dimensions of the EU security. Um, the EU security strategy states that they will to adopt a new counterterrorism counter agenda by 2021 that should expand as we hope the scope of the initiatives that has been taken so far. And I will end up with a few, few remarks that maybe can be further developed if you want in the question and answers. Uh, first of all, uh, some of the rules adopted in 2017 must be adapted to a menace that has consistently changed. We were always in the forefront on this topic, and one of the proposals we, we were raising was the extension of the European Public Prosecutor's Office that will become effective in 2021 to international terrorism offenses. As stated also by the EU security strategy, that is a step that cannot be delayed further if we want to really have a joint approach also to investigation on, and on the dismantling of of this kind of networks. It increases information sharing also among the member states. Nowadays, we have seven different databases currently present within uh, the EU level, but we have to foster the interoperability. And another requirement, of course, is to strengthen uh, uh, the cooperation with partners to include also, of course, UK that should continue to remain a pillar of the European and transatlantic security architecture also in the post-Brexit era. So here we have, of course, a matter of technical improvement for the interoperability, but also we have to see a clear will and commitment from member states to use those platforms and the system of exchange of data. Again, the institutional negotiation to establish a clear rules for exchanging digital evidences among member states that must be concluded as quickly as possible uh, for empowering, again, the national and the European authorities to make use of these essential elements. Uh, I hope this institutional negotiation will find very soon a positive outcome. Again, e extremely important, the anti-money laundering directives that are set at the European level must be adopted by all the member states. We cannot uh, allow any gap, any black hole that somehow in our legislation to uh, coordinate the efforts against the terrorist financing, because of course, uh, with the use of massive uh, financial resources, the threat can escalate quickly in, level or in, or in, in, in the level of danger and full exploit the potential by new technologies and support innovation. We are established, we established and we are thinking about the establishment of an innovation hub managed by Europol at the service of the whole European Union. So this is also another important outcome. And last but not the least, to set union-wide rules for countering the diffusion of online propaganda material. In my opinion, is absolutely essential as controversial since it must be done without violating core principles such as the freedom of expression and thought that are core values and uh, really undefectable principles of the EU. But we have to really uh, make a clear distinction between threatening and innocent behaviors that, that, that must be established for the sake, of course, of the strong defense of the rule of law. But nevertheless, this is uh, one of the most dangerous uh, weapon in the hands of uh, jihadism, and the use of online propaganda, and we can try to define in the proper way this uh, definition, avoiding, of course, to let them this easy way to recruit and to find persons that are um, susceptible to be uh, um, encouraged to radicalize themselves. I will stop here and I will be glad, of course, to answer to additional questions then on the issues and the points I've raised. Thank you so much. Yes, we will elaborate further a bit in the Q&A session. I will now give word to Dr. Alcorn. Great. Thanks, um, the Deutsche Institute, for having me today. And um, 
I'll be showing some research that I've been doing over the past um, couple years into um, the narratives um, of the extreme right, um, as well as counter narrative responses um, and kind of layering into that. I will also um, talk about some research that um, I've done talking to people at the um, sharp end in terms of um, responding um, to these movements um, online. So let me just um, that's great. Um, I hope that that displays the right screen. Um, it, does it show the um, the slides or is it the preview of the? Um, um, I think you're muted, sorry. Um, let me just... Um, yeah, if you, that? sorry, um, if you swap display on the top of your screen, then you... Yeah. Um, let me just, uh, what I'd do is I'll just do, I'll just, just click through with um, this fairly minimize. Okay. Um, I think that's probably the, the easiest thing to do. Um, so yeah, um, this is part of a, a project that um, myself and the Sense of the Analysis of the Radical Right um, did with um, uh, Hedaya, um, and it's funded by the um, EU Strive Fund, um, which is um, for strengthening resilience against violent extremism. Um, so in terms of the threat picture, when it comes to the um, far right, um, as we've seen um, over the past, uh, five years. Um, according to the Global Terrorism Index, um, there's been a 320% um, increase um, in the number of um, attacks. Um, we see a more aggressive picture when we're looking um, at America, but also in the EU with attacks in Germany um, and in other um, member states. Um, and in the UK, um, policymakers have also um, been trying to um, address this increase in terms of people referred um, to preventing violent extremism, um, yeah, um, structures like um, Channel. Um, and it, yeah, so we have this quote here from um, Neil Basu, who's one of the um, chief um, intendants of the, um, the police in London, talking about it as being the fastest growing problem um, for their um, yeah, in, in the UK, but also more, more broadly. Um, so we can see um, also kind of a change in terms of how um, the far right has used the internet. Um, it's kind of followed the path of jihadi terrorism. It's been um, perhaps slightly late um, in terms of its use of technology, um, but it's kind of quickly catching up um, using more kind of dark social media, um, as well as uh, as it kind of be as the main companies kind of deplatform um, some of the key groups, um, but also kind of fairly transnational in terms of its networking um, online um, with lots of um, subcultures and, and communities um, on sort of unregulated um, spaces and platforms and using those as a source to recruit um, and also to, to organize. Um, and so when we think about how we kind of respond to this, um, I think narratives, um, storytelling um, and counter narratives um, play quite um, a key role um, in terms of um, both diverting people away from um, more kind of heavy commitment in terms of activism, um, but also the more upstream end, um, kind of making sure that people um, their grievances don't escalate to um, to engaging um, in, in violent extremist um, uh, groups and ideologies. Um, so let me just move on. So one of the key outputs from the Hadai project uh, was an expert workshop. Um, we had about uh, 50 or so um, experts in radical right extremism from across um, the world um, talking and getting together to think about uh, what some of the key narratives, but also what would make an effective um, counter narrative response um, in this space. So some of the narratives identified are probably fairly familiar. Um, I think when we're talking about the far right, we have to be 
aware that we're not talking about one kind of monolithic ideology. We're usually talking about several different strands, um, whether that be the more culturally nationalist groups who are more anti-Islam. Um, so narrative one on this one um, maps onto those sort of um, those sort of groups. Um, then you have moving along the kind of spectrum of severity, more ethno-nationalist um, groups, um, groups like um, Generation Identity, uh, which talk about a great replacement, uh, white marginalization, um, and uh, this conspiracy theory of, of white genocide. Um, and um, then we have the more extreme um, racially nationalist groups, um, neo-Nazis, um, who um, yeah might engage in um, fairly esoteric forms of, of um, white nationalist um, ideology. Um, so we captured two of those on the, these narratives. There's also been um, attempts at more populist, um, uh, yeah, um, trying to kind of um, look at discontents um, around with governments and distrust. Um, so that relates to three and five, and uh, I guess a concerning picture um, adding to that kind of anti-government um, sentiment has been um, the um, incel movement and some of the more misogynist um, parts of the, the radical right spectrum, which is more typical in the US case when we see um, attacks being, being made um, both in Canada and the US over the past several years, but also um, we're also seeing um, people um, being being radicalized into these movements into violent action um, in in the in Europe as well. Um, so I think it's good to be aware of that. Um, just just trigger warning: some of these um, some of these narratives are fairly upsetting. Um, so <laughs> um, so please, um, yeah, um, do what you will to um, to perhaps not. Um, yeah, perhaps mute for a second. Um, so in the UK, we have um, a full spectrum of, of fairly extreme right wing groups um, that have mainly been now prescribed. Um, so we had um, national action initially prescribed at the end of, of 2016 and then several of its offshoots, um, the System Resistance Network, as well as Solon Creek um, Division um, were prescribed early in the um, the year of 2020, but if we're thinking more internationally, these groups are part of, um, they were part of the Iron March um, website um, and a whole array of, of, of groups um, that now adhere to what we call kind of siege culture, um, accelerationist um, uh, form of, of far right ideology. Um, so these are some of the, the narratives um, that particularly um, kind of problematic um, in relation to those. Um, we have another group called the Order of the Nine Angles, which also has a, um, an international um, reach. Um, and we can see here some form fairly kind of esoteric and marginal forms of their ideology, um, almost like an alternative form of, of spiritualism when it comes to things like worshipping um, Hitler, but also um, more pagan forms of um, of ideology. Um, so um, yeah, um, let me just move on. Um, so in terms of responding, um, this is based on a paper that um, I've co-authored with um, fellow researcher Kathy Condor. Um, and what we kind of argued in the piece was that um, what we need to see more of in, on the online space is moving from more reactive um, forms um, of intervention towards more um, proactive ones. So we have seen um, on the main platforms a fairly strong um, meet, uh, vigilance by some of the key um, key um, social media platforms, um, so Facebook and Twitter, um, and other um, other kind of mainstream platforms. Um, but what's been interesting is how that's affected. Um, the broader far ecosystem. A lot of these groups are now organizing on um, more unregulated platforms like Telegram um, and Gab um, and using those as a way to actually inform um, kind of or instruct people um, 
to commit forms of activism on the more mainstream platforms. So we have to take this more kind of ecosystem uh, approach when we're thinking about um, uh, deplatforming. Um, and there's quite a, a, a hot debate at the moment um, around how effective um, it will be and, and what it will do in terms of uh, driving um, individuals to more um, extreme and, and marginal um, sectors of the far right more broadly, which is quite concerning. Um, so there's, um, I mean, there's other um, kind of tools in the toolkit. Um, we can think about surveillance, but that comes with some um, legal and um, also ethical um, constraints um, in terms of um, kind of, yeah, looking into these groups. Um, there often has to be substantive uh, criminal act evidence of terrorism for um, authorities to have to stand in. Um, in the UK and the EU, I think we've got a fairly good and developed um, framework. Some countries are better than others, particularly Germany is quite um, leading in terms of holding um, uh, mainstream platforms to account when hate speech um, um, arrives, um, giving them fairly stiff penalties. Um, in the UK, we do have um, an online harms bill, which is going through um, government and parliament, um, and hopefully that will see a more kind of um, serious criminalization of, of hate speech. Um, and then finally, um, and this is um, kind of um, key, I think, in terms of um, going forward, um, is to have more collaboration and kind of proactive interventions um to kind of off ramp um individuals um on the far right um as well as also um kind of a better evidence base when we're we're talking about putting together um counter narrative campaigns um so at car we're we're in the process of of testing um some of the counter narratives that we came up with in the uk um yeah to see what works and, and what's effective um, I'm just thinking about timing. Um, so in terms of um, recommendations, um, kind of across national level, um, I think one of the, the key things is having clearer definitions um, on kind of a, agreed um, radical right extremist groups that pose um, a threat to um, democracy um, and might be inspiring others um, to more violent acts. Um, What's interesting is the UN in terms of the, the different groups. I don't think there's any um, uh, far right groups listed um, as terrorist organizations. And I think that needs to change and perhaps be updated um, in relation to um, what um, national governments um, have been seeing. Um, there needs to be better um, kind of international collaboration um, on sharing intelligence data and, and methodologies around um, combating um, the violent extreme right threats um, more, and this is probably what Marie will talk about, more advanced um, computational techniques. Um, we've seen things like the redirect method being used, where if people are kind of searching for um, neo-Nazi or terrorist material on Facebook or, or on Google, um, that they're off-ramped to um, videos um, or help um, that might um, help to, to kind of puncture their um, uh, kind of escalation um, towards more problematic forms of, of extreme activism. Um, I think everyone needs to play their part. Um, so not just um, kind of the legal political sphere, but also um, citizens as well, um, I think have a, a key role to play and um, kind of a pincer movement from the top, but also from below, I think a lot of education um, in terms of critical awareness around um, disinformation and um, also recruitment strategies by the extreme right online um, perhaps needs to be um, rolled out more fully. And then finally, as I was talking about earlier, um, we have to have this more ecosystems approach. Um, can't just like deplatforming is, is, is good. It kind of reduces the um, the further kind of spread of um, particular narratives and, and problematic ideology. Um, 
but it doesn't um, see these these activists go away. So um, we have to kind of um, hold that in mind um, and think about some more creative approaches that we can um, think of in terms of um, yeah being being proactive and and not just reactive in in terms of our responses. So just finally. Um, a lot of these materials be very helpful um, for practitioners um, that we've produced through the Hadaya project. So um, they've started to um, put these um, reports that we have um, in terms of the um, European sphere, we have um, reports on um, the UK, Germany, Ukraine, Hungary um, and Norway. Um, and those will be going up on um, Hadaya's website as well as the, their counter narrative library, which you can register to. They have a whole host of material on the jihadist um, side of things and how to put together um, counter narrative um, communication campaigns on that side of things. Um, but we were tasked with the, the radical rights and the extreme rights um, side of things. So those will start going up online um, uh, very shortly. So thanks um, for this opportunity and um, look forward to the questions. Um, and I'll see the floor now. Thank you very much uh, for your talk and that nice PowerPoint presentation. I will now give the floor to Ms. Schröter. Thank you, uh, Ms. Sass. Um, thank you also for inviting me. I'm very delighted to be able to share my thoughts and um, to virtually sit with such distinguished panelists around the table. Um, it's a pleasure. Um, I will talk about how AI can be leveraged to counter radicalization and terrorism online. Um, AI, artificial intelligence, is a very fashionable term. And quite often I have the feeling when people are asking, like, how can we, how can we use AI in this or that area? What non-technical experts are actually asking for is a magic bullet to solve whatever. Um, so before I go into the specifics of counterterrorism and counter-radicalization, I would take the liberty to speak a tiny little bit about artificial intelligence in general, just to make sure that we have uh, the same understanding of it. So what is AI? Uh, we're actually talking about a software or a program with an element of automation. And to a certain degree, that program can improve performance over time. Good AI requires, and I cannot stress this often enough, very good data. And oftentimes, vast amounts of it. Um, very, and, a, and a very good quality, often labeled data. Um, so we can train the algorithms with that. And more traditional machine learning algorithms need a lot of data, but what people are talking about these days, most of the time, are deep neural networks, and they need even more data. They're also more precise, but need more very good data. Um, most of you have most probably heard about problems of bias and data sets. Uh, there have been examples of uh, human resources automations um, that basically turned out as um, racist, uh, anti-feminist software tools at the end of the day, only hiring males, white males, in a certain span of age. So that what happens if there is bias in data sets, it gets multiplied through um, the algorithms. Also, the, the term artificial intelligence is really misleading because by no means artificial intelligence, the software is able to think in a specific way or to learn like humans do. Um, AI is usually programmed for a very specific task. And then the algorithm decides, yes, the condition, I can agree to the condition or I cannot agree to the condition, for example, I identify a dog on a picture or I don't identify a dog on a picture, but we do not necessarily need what else is identified or we do not like a human would give context or meaning to 
identifying a dog on the picture. Everyone has seen one on Twitter and, you know, had some emotions about it. An algorithm doesn't have that. That's important to keep in mind, especially when talking about the area of counterterrorism and counter radicalization. And the results produced by algorithms, they reflect probability. And no way do they reflect any kind of proof. It's a probabilistic outcome that element X, Y, Z maybe equals ABC when we are talking about matching technology. So that was my caveat. And now I'm going to link over to uh, use cases and terrorism and radicalization. Everyone who has ever digged into the issue of terrorism and radicalization is most probably aware of the issue that there are no universally accepted definitions, not from political actors, not from academic actors. And then think about you're a programmer and you have to operationalize that into code. It's a bit tricky, isn't it? Um, and that also reflects on the applications or use cases that we have of AI and counterterrorism and counter radicalization. They are maybe not as shiny and fancy as, as you imagine them to be. So AI cannot predict radicalization on an individual level in a way that's useful to, for example, law enforcement agencies. Quite often, there is not enough data, but also radicalization is a very individualized process. Um, when people are talking about this kind of systems who would be able to do that, they oftentimes have a science, science fiction inspired version of maybe the system from the minority report in mind. Um, a system that tells us, look, person X, Y, Z is radicalizing at the moment. And just before they commit a crime, they let us know and automatically maybe already send uh, law enforcement to the location which has been identified and all the rest. There are various huge problems with that scenario. A, there are important ethical questions involved. That would require real-time surveillance of individuals in which liberal democracy would that, would that be accepted? That's a question of uh, proportionality. Would we accept to be, <laughs> to allow um, security bodies to gather that bulk data in order to identify terrorists and extremists or radicalizing individuals? Um, is, is that imbalance for us? Um, do we have the data on an individual level? Um, and think about what, what lifetime trackers would need in that respect. Um, most of the predictions are usually based on aggregated data of groups. Um, what exactly would we tell programmers to code? Would we look at ethnicity, religion, posting of certain um, pictures using certain words. Um, and using certain words brings me to the next difficulty, everything that has to do with language. Language is extremely complex. Um, you all know that you address different groups in a different way, whether that's your parents or that's a group of experts or maybe talking to journalists, whatever. You use different language each time. Um, there is slang. And whereas we have lots of data on um, dominant languages, such as English, we have less so when it comes to minority languages. Um, and also minority languages, that's not like one block of language. Also there we have different uh, like groups that use different slang. We have um, languages that do not use the Latin alphabet, but out of convenience on social media, they do translate their language or their alphabet into the Latin one, because it's just easier to do. Then people who speak more than one language, they also use different languages in one sentences. So I'm just saying that from what we can see, also looking at content moderation, AI is not there to filter out everything. 
And again, we have to ask the question, what are we willing to accept in terms of error rates? So now that I've talked about all the negative sides, let me highlight some, some positives. But those use cases are a bit narrow compared to the other like grand uh, images of how AI can solve all problems. So law enforcement agencies have to deal with a lot of data in usually a very critical short time span. So what AI can do is go through that data and help identifying relationships or maybe certain keywords. AI can help to just visualize whatever is there in terms of findings and just help human analysts to do their work more efficiently. The AI would not make any decisions based on the findings, but make it just more accessible, easier, quicker. A social network analysis would help to see who's related with whom and who had contact with whom. And then from a from the platforms, social media platforms point of views, um, that's what William already mentioned. Um, there is this hashing technology, there is a big hashing database. Whenever they identify malicious items, you can put it in a, in a hashing database, uh, which is oftentimes described as a digital fingerprint. And then that triggers a systematic uh, takedown of that malicious content across different platforms. Um, not every platform is part of that database, but it's an industry led start to tackle the problem. And then organizations like um, Tech Against Terrorism provide more support for smaller platforms because um, Abdul, William, please correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, it's a trend that terrorist extremists are going to more niche fringe platforms, which have oftentimes uh, less resources to um, tackle terrorist use of their or exploitation of their platforms. So Tech Against Terrorism is there to support them as well. Um, then we have the redirect method, which has already been mentioned. I don't want to go into it again. Um, Whoever wants to look for it can Google Moonshot CVE efforts. And to sum it up, my takeaway points are basically policymakers do not have to understand AI and its nitty gritty details. But what I want them to do is look more into the definitions that are lacking, agree on definitions, look at the lists of designations, give clear regulations to the social media platforms and clarify what, what is expected from them to do, especially when it comes to blurry concepts like hate speech. Um, because at the moment, quite often, social media platforms have to decide themselves where to draw the line, uh, which kind of outsources critical uh, points to them. Um, and then we shall not forget that no technical intervention can resolve the underlying drivers of radicalization um, and the drive to, to extremism or terrorism. So um, it has been mentioned before, I want to underline it again, critical awareness of disinformation, fostering digital literacy. I'm co-founder of the Dictive Collective that's doing exactly that or is aiming to do exactly that debunking fake news with the help of the community. And I'm happy to go into more details during the Q&A. And that's, that's it from my side. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was very interesting. Um, since Mr. Casello has to leave soon, maybe already one question for him. Um, what is the outlook of the EU regarding climate change, migration, and new tensions that may give rise to radicalization? And how do you think we should handle this? Thank you. Thank you very much for this very interesting question, uh, dear joke. Uh, let me say that in recent months in general, uh, the coronavirus pandemic has offered to all of us a test around on whether humanity has the capacity 
to avert a predictable and predicted catastrophe. While there were some remarkable examples in, of solidarity, we can comfortably also say that the test overall so far has failed. The climate crisis will test us again on a larger scale with higher stakes. The EU is probably just now realizing the importance to invest in all the strategic preparedness to build up societies able to cope with global challenges such as terrorism and climate or climate change. This global challenge has and will continue to create a multitude of critical issues that the international communities must confront, including large scale human migration due to resource scarcity, increased frequency of extreme weather uh, events, intensifying intra and interstate competition for food, water, and other resources. This is already under our, our sight, under our eyes in Africa, for example and an increased frequency and severity of disease outbreaks and increased border stress due to the severe effects of climate change in the global south. Uh, Counterterrorism and national security measures undertaken by the states have also had in some cases an, in, an adverse impact on the refugee protection. These include the unduly restrictive legislation and an administrative measures, lack of access to asylum procedures, the criminalization of refugees and asylum seekers, which has negatively affected the public perception so far of the world phenomenon. As the refugees stream out of the Middle East and North Africa into Europe and and from Central America into the United States, the stark policy choices are already becoming apparent, as well as the deep polarization within the societies. An anti-immigrant backlash, backlash has propelled national governments into power around the world, and has led also to a gradual stigmatization and criminalization of migrants that fuels phenomena of marginalization and radicalization. Uh, let me say again that the EU policies that we must aim at uh, concerning migration so should establish a clear link with mig migration, crime prevention, economic, social employment, and education policies. The measures to address the condition conducive to the spread of terrorism must include ensuring equal treatment and combating racism and xenophobia, targeting against certain racial and ethnic minorities, religions, and other vulnerable groups, such, uh, such as the refugees, as well as countering political exclusion and socioeconomic marginalization of minorities that is one of the main causes of uh, the process of radicalization. The scope and the scale of human migration due to climate change will test and will rise up, of course, so again, we'll test the limits of national and global governance as well as an international cooperation. In my opinion, if we have a look at that, the best outcome requires not only goodwill and the careful management of turbulent political forces. Without preparation and planning, the sweeping scale of change could prove wildly destabilizing for our societies and the whole European integration project. The alternative, driven by a better understanding of how and when people will move, is governments that are actively preparing, both materially and politically, for the greater changes to come. The uh, political responses to both climate change, migration and terrorism can lead to drastically different futures. The EU cooperation of migration so far has unveiled the central weakness of within the EU. The different number member states are, have some reluctance to cooperate based on the EU interest rather than the national interest. This reveals a core EU flow, its limited authority and the high dependency on domestic commitments. It's under our eyes. It was one of the biggest crises we didn't have solved so far, still uh, in, in, a in the decade, we were failing to provide a massive and uh, important reform of the Dublin system. Now again, we have another proposal, the pa last package proposed by Commissioner Johansson, but it is going to be again, it's going to fuel again divisions within the EU, and it's already frustrating those one who are looking for more solidarity, as well as the other one saying that there are too much, uh, there is too much openness. That so again, it's a subject that is polarizing the hemicycle, the European Parliament and the whole European debate. Let me conclude to say that the, this development of strategies to mitigate the most destabilizing aspects of mass migration offer to all of us the possibility to regather public trust, international credibility, regional influence for the EU, but it's also something we can achieve if we are going to invest an adequate amount of resources. Uh, that means, of course, uh, 
to continue strengthen strengthen all the uh, trust found and the other means that we have for our geopolitical action. Now we have a new uh, big instrument, the so-called NDICI fund, that is a kind of a common framework for all European policies towards third parties. Uh, but of course, this is not enough. There was a huge fight even in the multi-annual financial framework, uh, which the parliament was calling for more ambitious resources uh, allocated uh, to this approach while some member states were fighting to reduce as much as possible to do not to also decrease their national contribution to the um, uh, to these to, to, to the multi-annual financial framework and that is uh, my opinion is contradictory because you are uh, on one side setting very ambitious goals on the other side you are depriving yourself of, of the instrument uh, to achieve those goals it uh, does not fit to uh, the behaviors does not fit together if we will fail so to uh, we will not uh, only further undermine the, the so desperately needed of our public trust, or we also undercut the re reliability with third countries and the authority within also international arena. And to, we will give basically to all the populist parties another fertile ground to exploit uh, all these uh, um, the, the consequences of the problem instead of facing the roots of, of the problem. And again, of course, uh, this at the end will lead. Uh, to increase the, the ability of terrorists to destabilize the state, state's social cohesion and the trust in government. So again, uh, uh, the solution is, un, is, is in our hands. It's a matter of political will. And uh, trust me, from on my personal basis, for my personal sensibility, I will continue to push the European Commission and, and the Council, that means the national governments, to comply uh, with the, the uh, so uh, such a magnificent and ambitious declaration they are often often uh, um, pronouncing in official occasions. So again, it's a matter of coherence. I hope we will be able to fulfill this geopolitical role. Thank you so much for that. Um, since we have to leave soon, I already want to thank you for joining us. We appreciate it very much, and hopefully, till we meet pleasure. next time. Whenever you want, it will be again a pleasure to take part. And again, my best congratulations to all the other speakers for their very interesting remarks and contribution to, to this debate. I would be totally available to continue the dialogue and the, and the debate uh, at, at your convenience. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry to leave, but it was unfortunately uh, a commitment I couldn't cancel with an interview. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Um, Ido, if you have questions. Ido, you are on mute. Yeah, um, I had a question for Abdul, uh, Mr. Basit. Um, you were talking about the influence also of COVID on the education system. And of course, it also has a very big impact on the economic uh, position of countries. Uh, what are the feelings? Uh, what are your feelings about the long-term consequences? Uh, so, will the um, impact of COVID nineteen not have maybe a direct impact on terrorism? But what are the general theories of uh, shock in economics and the economic situation? And how does would that impact possible uh, future problems within the country uh, in the long term? One, uh, one thing difficult in measuring uh, even the long-term impacts of COVID-19 on terrorism is that even if we, you know, use the analogy of tsunami uh, and how terrorism evolved in particular regions post-tsunami, so tsunami receded in a couple of days. And the post disaster, uh, you know, damage assessments were done in weeks and months. So we knew exactly what has happened and what resources are required in which areas to overcome those. Uh, and so, so there was a clear picture. And in the immediate aftermath of those uh, disasters, uh, terrorism increased, but in the longer run, uh, violence or militancy decreased. With, uh, with COVID-19, the issue is it is still unfolding. 
So we are like in the middle of it and we are really not sure that how long it is going to last, uh, uh, what will be the impacts of the vaccine roll, rollouts that are currently being, you know, uh, administered in different parts of the world. And then uh, once we emerged on the other side of it, uh, how long uh, the economic recessions are going to be. So I think that makes it difficult to, you know, really predict. Uh, so far on the available information, uh, uh, we, we can say that the impact on the physical violence side has been minimal. Uh, on the narrative side, uh, initially, there was a lot of noise uh, f across the ideological spectrum, as I mentioned, but then, you know, it it was surrounding around more mundane things, day-to-day uh, -day, uh, and typical issues that various groups uh, focus on. Uh, one thing that is repeatedly, you know, uh, uh, mentioned in research, which has come out, uh, uh, policy and academic research, uh, looking at the relationship between COVID-19 and terrorism is one repeated concern is the longer the pandemic lasts, uh, uh, you know, the longer it will take states to emerge out of uh, this crisis. And that uh, prolonged uh, period where uh, the ability of uh, various states to provide for jobs, uh, you know, uh, uh, and come out of economic recession, that prolonged stability resulting in anti-establishment uh, sentiments, uh, emergence of various protest movements. We are already seeing that in the West. And prior to COVID-19, if you remember, there were a lot of protests going on in different parts of the world, Latin America, Hong Kong, parts of Europe, particularly France. We saw these uh, protests even in Lebanon, uh, there were protests in Iraq, even in Iran, there were protests going on uh, uh, and, and democracy, uh, you know, went through this uh, movement of uh, confidence crisis. So uh, we really have to see, you know, how things evolved in the post pandemic world. Uh, but uh, so far, what we have seen is, though there is a lot of noise and uh, these groups are trying to, you know, further their narratives how many people actually, you know, buy into that? Because uh, people, uh, you know, consuming extremist material online and actually going down the path of radicalization, it's not very straightforward and linear. It's a very complicated relationship and it has to evolve a lot of factors, environment, individual factors, other factors, and that if they come together, you know, and we, we know that it's a minority phenomenon. Radicalization is a minority phenomenon. Uh, so we'll have to wait and watch, but definitely what is worrying at the cost of repeating myself is while there is less violence, more noise, uh, but we are seeing as uh, uh, various panelists have mentioned this, that there is increasing polarization. Uh, a lot of conspiracy theories based on misinformation, disinformation, uh, and, and intolerance, hatred, uh, those narratives are out there. So these are foundational elements of violent extremism. So that is something to worry about. And a lot of it is on the internet, but internet is a great enabler. So how within this ecosystem, how do you, you know, move forward with that is a challenge. Okay. And with so much of ideological confluence in different, uh, you know, sections of violent extremism, whether it is the jihadist side or the, or the, or the far right in the West, uh, it makes it challenging. So I think it is unfolding. Uh, and uh, we'll be in a, in a better position to assess this once we emerge on the other side. For now, what we can say with certainty is that physical violence, uh, it hasn't impacted much on the narrative side. Yes, there has been a lot of noise, uh, uh, whether it translates into something physical post the pandemic, we'll have to wait and see for that. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Marie, uh, Ms. Schutter, sorry. Um, if you, yeah, uh, we uh, heard that uh, you also have to leave in a few minutes. Um, so we had a short question. Uh, you mentioned it um, about Detective Collective on the ways that you uh, make uh, better digital literacy. Uh, could you maybe uh, go into that for a little bit more? Yeah, sure. I'd like to. Thank you for that question. I'm always happy to think about Detective Collective. Um, so about a year ago, 
Um, it was a group of 10 volunteers coming together um, during a German hackathon um, aiming to find effects of the pandemic. And we all met in the room for fighting the infodemic. And quite quickly, we realized that we would like to come up with um, a solution that does not rely on AI, but rather the community. So what we did over the course of one year in a mostly voluntary capacity, I have to say, um, only in November, we got funding which allowed us to, to like actually pay two people for their work. The rest of the group is still uh, made up of volunteers. So we wrote together a catalog of indicators to look at the credibility of digital news items. That's fundamentally different from fact checking. Um, our thinking was that if we're working with lots of um, volunteering detectives, as we call them, uh, we cannot really do fact checking because we don't know whether we have the expertise in the community to check if a certain chemical is appropriate as a vaccine against COVID-19. But what we can do, and that goes into the direction of media literacy, digital literacy, is does the headline fit actually the text? Is the picture that has been used from that specific context? Are there any experts who are cited as experts? Do they really have the expertise in that subject matter? Um, does the website have a proper um, proper information about who's behind the whole enterprise, you know, all those small little details. So we have a catalog of questions that go through those details. Um, the detectives are then um, giving an indication of a scale, whether they agree or do not agree and everything in between. And if a lot of detectives have done that for one item, then we come up with a credibility score at the end and the credibility score is visible in our public archive, as we call it. So last week we had our stress test. That's uh, normal in, in software uh, development areas um, where we had for the first time quite a lot of um, detectives. We've learned a lot in terms of technical, but also conceptual feedback. So I would say, give us another couple of weeks and then we're going to open up the, the platform for everyone. Um, it's targeted at a German speaking audience at the moment. Um, it is obviously interesting to us to expand to other languages as well, but we're simply not there yet. And our immediate aim is to make a difference for the German federal election happening in autumn this year. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> it's uh, very interesting and ambitious. Yeah, um, a lot of yeah. Good luck with uh, the entire project, and we will be sure to spread it also for our, our uh, media uh, channels. Uh, so do send us a link uh, whenever it's ready, uh, if you would. Um, thank you very much. And yeah, I heard yeah that you kind of have to leave, uh, but we also still had a question for William. Uh, Dr. Elkin, pardon me. Um, so if that's all right, uh, but yeah, feel free to uh, uh, to uh, to go if you have to. <laughs> um, uh, Joke, did you have one? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, I was uh, thinking also about uh, the new media platforms. So um, the ones that aren't really regulated yet. Um, and you also discussed uh, yeah, the difficulties uh, in handling that. Um, how much do you feel or think, uh, maybe also based on your research, uh, does the government power go um, or how far does it go in order to legislate or regulate those uh, parts? And do you think it would be effective or would it just yeah, relocate to another thing? Um, yeah, and I think that's that's a really um, interesting question. I think um, like platforms like Telegram have got slightly better um, 
at kind of um, restricting and and kind of taking off um, content that might be um, considered to be kind of um, uh, kind of the underlying ideological um, basis for um, for terrorist activity, um, whether that's far right or um, or Islamist. Um, I mean, it's it's a very um, tricky space. Um, for, for governments um, to tread in, um, particularly when you have organizations um, like, for example, GAB is based in the US where they have very strong um, kind of protections against, uh, so sorry, for um, freedom of speech. Um, so there's always, in terms of jurisdictional um, kind of, um, yeah, um, location of some of these um, companies, so unregulated um, companies, it's, it's very difficult, um, yeah, to, to, to regulate um, these, um, these platforms um, effectively. And as Marie was talking about in terms of um, the Global Internet Forum for Counterterrorism, um, they're adding companies, some of the smaller companies, um, but it's largely some of the, the bigger companies who are taking a more proactive approach anyway. Um, that there are a part of those um, collaboration initiatives. Um, so, yeah, um, I don't know whether there's, I mean, there is, I guess there is a role um, for government, um, but I guess we have to be very, very careful in the rush to um, investigate these smaller platforms that we don't um, infringe um, human rights and, and democratic norms and for the far right it's especially um, tricky picture because a lot of um, the ideology and some of the narratives are actually um, on the more mainstream manifestations of the far right are but um, or quite close to the mainstream um, which makes it I guess this this um, idea of, of definitions even more important and I think we're working on that but we're not we're not anywhere close um, to where we need to be, um, uh, yeah. In order to 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 make those um, better decisions about what content gets um, taken down, um, so yeah, um, it's a very uh, uh, con convoluted answer. But um, but I, yeah, I think that um, it's um, yeah, it it, it it's it's going to be. Um, an interesting test um, going forward in terms of um, how governments deal with this and um, I don't think there should be there was there was that rush after 9-11 um, to, to put up a scaffold of counter-terrorism architecture and we've seen some of the problematic um, incidences especially targeting the, the Muslim community and I think we need to be especially careful um, when it comes to the far right, there's lots of conversations in the US at the moment about how they can um, respond to the um, the renewed threat um, after the election. But um, but yeah, I think we have to be slightly cautious um, to not um, have emotional thinking when we're um, approaching these problems, not to rush in too quickly. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, thank you to all panelists uh, for the very interesting uh, speeches and uh, questions and answers. Um, yeah, we again, we'd like to thank you for uh, giving us the time to uh, participate and for wanting to participate. Uh, if this was real life, I'd, uh, we'd give you a bottle of wine, but unfortunately due to COVID and yeah, uh, it's a bit difficult. Um, so the uh, recording, yeah, so the meeting, the webinar has been recorded. Uh, so I'll post it on our YouTube page, on our Facebook page. It's also been on you know, Facebook Live. Um, and we'll also uh, yeah, save the audio and uh, put it as a podcast uh, on Spotify. Um, so it will be shared <laughs> and known. Um, thank you very much again. Uh, thank you all. And, uh, yeah, well, you hope to uh, stay in touch. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Yeah, really interesting panel. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, learned a lot today, so thank you. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye. Bye.